Welcome to episode 43 of Successful Demo Each episode and like the third anchor podcast aspects of one you release cards Today we'll be looking at Mwanza City Grid This card reads Whenever the runner accesses cards from this server Either or your HQ They access three additional cards Wait, 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 what? You want, mate? You're giving the runner extra accesses? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it's a co-op card that helps the runner win the game. Okay, uh, let's theory craft. I guess Mwanza City Grid goes very well in a deck that contains Akshara, Serene, and Harvester, i.e. a deck of full of binder cards that you should never ever bring out to the open. No, seriously, why are you even helping your opponent win the game? That just blows my mind. So this is the kind of top tier jank card uh, that um, actually, I so I, I I wouldn't explain it myself. Um, if you actually checked out episode twenty four of Dead Channels podcast, uh, Jono and Chris Dyer do a very good job of describing the types of players that Wanza City Grid appeals to. Go check out the uh, go check out their review of Wanza City Grid um, because they really offer a very fresh perspective uh, of it. Uh, for now, over here, we'll just talk about the card's numbers and what this card does, i.e. besides helping your opponent, I guess Mwanza City Grid, you know, gives you quite a bit of money. That's something not to be est- uh, underestimated. At zero rest costs, um, Mwanza City Grid uh, typically offers a 10 credit gain. Uh, because the runner typically accesses their regular single access, plus 3 from Mwanza City Grid's detrimental effect, plus the access of Mwanza City Grid itself. This is a total of 5 accesses, which gives you a plus 10 credit gain. Pretty good gain for a single card that could potentially fire multiple times. Now, as we noted, this card has an R&D slash HQ restriction. You can only install it in one of those two central servers. And finally, it is of uh, 1 influence cost. Um, so you can actually splash this in other factions. This could be a useful uh, trait that we'll get to in a moment. So the big question is, since Wanza City Grid comes with such a big downside, um, if you are building a deck that contains this grid, you really want <laughs> um, to actually build around this card in the sense that you need to mitigate its downside or you know take advantage of its upside. So there's a bunch of stuff uh, and you want to be covering at least one, if not multiple of these traits in order to make Wanza City Grid even remotely playable. Firstly, you could potentially take advantage of Wanza City Grid on archives. Now you're not allowed to install Wanza straight up on archives, but if you have a card like Metamorph that allows you to swap the positions of two of your installed non-ice cards, you are able to swap and upgrade on archives with um, Wanza City Grid on HQ or R&D, allowing you to trigger Wanza City Grid off archives. That could potentially earn you a lot of money because then you gain two credits for every card in, every card in archives, essentially, when the runner runs archives. This, to me, is the worst possible interaction because, obviously, there is very little reason for a runner who knows what they're doing to run archives. And, you know, it requires so many moving pieces. It requires you to have two upgrades on those two servers, one of which is the Mwanza on the central, and you need to actually fire off the Metamorph, which is a code gate. So you probably need a Marcus Betty or something as well. It's super janky. I would not build this, uh, you know, build a deck around this at all. The second point you could possibly do is to prevent the runner from stealing multiple agendas off a Mwanza grid multi-axis. Uh, the one... Uh, thing that comes to mind here immediately is Harish Chandra, which has the unique effect of wait, what? I put Harish Chandra here. My bad. I meant Harpsichord. Yes, I'm so sorry for the wrong image. Um, you know, go check it out on Netrunner DB if you don't know what Harpsichord does. It uh prevents the runner from stealing more than one agenda a turn. So that way you can defend lots of uh you know defend against the multi access being uh very confident that the runner can only hit one agenda at most on each monster city grid run uh while you're still gaining the full ten credits so uh this is where the one influence cost of Wanza ties in because uh you can splash it for cheap in terms of influence and still have enough influence left over to play with other fun cards 
Another way in which you can take advantage, uh, you know, mitigate um, Wanza's problem is to punish the runner for stealing multiple agendas. So you can run lots of agendas and all of them very spiky. I'm thinking of Jinteki Personal Evolution and Argus Security, both of which are identities that allow the runner to steal multiple agendas in one run, but punish them for each agenda they access. So this could potentially be very powerful as a setup to uh, repeatedly deal damage to the runner. Speaking of repeatedly dealing damage, uh, another way to do this besides feeding agendas is to feed the runner ambushes. The big one that comes into mind is obviously Snare, which fires off both R&D and HQ. This could potentially lead to a nasty flatline if the runner isn't prepared for the Mwanza multi-access. You know, if Mwanza's unres, when the run starts, they don't see it coming, you res it and they're like, oh no, I'm now accessing four cards, multiple of which may be iron bushes, I'm in trouble. Right, so um, an important nuance here though, Mwanza City Grid awards you the money only after the entire access. So you're not allowed to use Mwanza's money to pay for your ambushes, your snares and such. So keep that in mind, you need to have enough money to fire all your ambushes to kill the runner, uh, even without the Mwanza there. So, you know, a bit of a prerequisite required. Right, finally, another subtle way in which uh, to, to make Mwanza better is to actually have a way to turn it off. Mwanza City Grid is not optional. You cannot choose to let the runner access fewer than the three additional cards. As such, um, the only way for the corp to turn Mwanza off is to override Mwanza with another upgrade, be it an, another unrest Mwanza or something like a Prizek. Uh, take note that unrest Mwanza City Grids do not uh, affect the multi-access and do not uh, grant the corp extra credits because well, it's unres, it's text box is blank. So having extra upgrades in your deck just to turn off Mwanza City Grid when you no longer need it is actually quite important because if you leave your Mwanza City Grid res in the mid to late game, what will most likely happen in most of your games is that in a final Hail Mary bit, the runner will most likely run on your Mwanza server and you know, they can potentially cheese the win away from you, even though you have it in the bag, by getting that multi-access that you never intended. So being able to turn off Monza at will is actually pretty important. I brought up Prysac as a typical upgrade simply because it's an ambush, so it fulfills the previous point as well about increasing the ambush hit rate. Uh, okay, so all those points are all fine and dandy, but I think the most important, the most salient, and uh, what I think is the best synergy with Wanza City Grid by far is a card that allows you uh, to power your win condition uh, in both ways with Wanza's effects, converting the plus 10 credits and the plus 3 access into win condition. Uh, and that is directly achieved with Punitive Counter Strike, right? Punitive Counter-Strike requires you to be richer than the runner, it also requires the runner to have stolen an agenda. Wanza City Grid feeds into both of these perfectly, giving you a huge credit push boost, 10 credits is no laughing matter, and the multi-access will give the runner all the agenda points they need to get killed by Punitive. This is a match made in heaven, and there's no doubt in my mind that we'll be playing these two cards hand in hand. Right, so with all that settled, there's just one question remaining, what if? I don't draw those punitive counter strikes, then I can't win off my alternate win condition. And worse, what happens if the runner steals a bunch of points off a single Mwanza run? As I mentioned, being able to turn off Mwanza is nice, but you can't do that, typically you can't do that during a paid ability window, you need a click to do that during your turn, and sometimes you just won't draw multiple upgrades. So how do you mitigate all these problems? Enter Bacterial Programming. This is a 5-3 agenda from this cycle that is pretty bonkers. Well, it has this a similar uh, trigger as SSL endorsement in that um, its effect fires regardless of whether the runner steals it or whether you score it. And when that happens, you can look at the top 7 cards of your deck and distribute them any way you like between R&D, HQ and Archives. That's a pretty neat effect. In fact, uh, I would think that the best use of bacterial programming by far is as a solid rush card. So the reason for this is very simple. You are able to, you know, have a look, 
have access basically have access to a one seventh of your deck a typical deck runs 49 cards seven cards is one seventh of it this means that on average if you have seven of a certain type of card you can be fairly sure that you'll see at least one of them during a bacterial programming fire so what kinds of cards would you run at least seven of in your deck agendas come to mind so if your agenda gets sto if your bacterial programming gets stolen and you get to look at your top seven cards chances are you will see at least one agenda in those top seven and you know you can do something with it you can immediately pull it to your hand uh, so that you can score it next turn which is a very good way to rush or you can bury it somewhere in r d making it harder for the runner to get it either way this is a very good way to rush it also helps you pull up combo pieces like Punitive Counter-Strike earlier as well, deeper through your deck. Um, it's also worth mentioning that each time you pull a card from Bacterial Programming into your HQ, that's a click saved. You know, that's a cl one click less spent drawing through your deck. And that absolutely matters when you're trying to rush the game through rushing through your deck. Being able to access so deep into your deck and pull out, fish out all those agendas that you want to score early, all those combo cards to kill the runner, are absolutely crucial. And finally, Bacterial Programming is defensive in itself as it mitigates multi-access if accessed from R&D. Now, this bears a lot of explaining. The way Bacterial Programming interacts with multi-access is very wonky, but it's something I need to bring up here because we are playing it with Mwanza City Grid after all. Imagine R&D looks like this. Uh, Kakugo as the topmost card of R&D and the snare is 8 cards down. So, the runner that imagine a runner does um Mwanza multi-access on this particular R and D. They are gonna see four cards. Don't forget one normal access plus three from Mwanza City Grid. The first card they access is the Kakugo. That's fine and dandy. Nothing happens. The second card they access is the Bacterial Programming, which they steal. Triggering its effect, the Corp gets to look at the top seven, which is the seven that you see on the screen here, and they get to rearrange it in any order they please. Now, Bacterial Programming does a lot of work. It can do so many things. I'm going to illustrate to it to you one by one. Firstly, you can bury agendas out of the runner's reach. In this case, we can put breaking news all the way at the bottom of R&D. Next, we can uh, drag ambushes all the way to the top of R&D, which the runner will continue accessing from. This way, you can basically force the runner into uh, accessing ambushes as long as they have accesses remaining. Following that, you can also um, top deck your combo cards, cards like Punitive Counter Strike that you want in your hand. You can put them on top so that you know previously these two punitives were the six and the seventh card respectively uh, down in R and D. You can bring them up to the first or second card in R and D meaning that you'll see them earlier, meaning that you can fire them as soon as your next turn arrives, right? Um, after they steal the bacterial programming, you can fire punitive for 3 meat damage, potentially killing them. And of course, all the other remaining cards that are irrelevant, you can just put them, bury them somewhere in R&D with bacterial programming's effect. So you arrange R&D like this, and then the runner continues accessing uh, from the top card onwards, regardless of how many cards they access just now. So don't forget, they access Kakugo first, Bacterial second. The third card they will access is actually this snare here, and it will fire. They can't jack out, don't forget, they are already committed to the run, committed to the four accesses. They will access the snare, it will fire. And then the fourth card they will access is yet another snare, which will also fire. So this is how you can induce the runner into hitting multiple ambushes as long as they hit the bacterial programming early on during the access. Of course, this bacterial programming um, rearrangement was just as a demo. Uh, you know, a, you know, ideally what you probably do is you would pull your punitive counter strikes to hand. Uh, I should use another ink color here. Uh, yeah. Instead of putting them as the third and fourth card in R and D, instead you can easily just uh, pull them uh, into HQ, and you know fire fire immediately next turn without any worries. So that's how bacterial programming works. Um, as if it's hit from R and D, uh, the runner c resumes access from the very top card, uh, regardless of how many cards they accessed previously. So bacterial programming, as you can see, is a very flexible effect that can do so many things. And it's clickless, 
And the only downside, obviously, is that the runner just stole three points. But that's an upside when you're running punitive counter-strike, which is really awesome. There's just one little problem, though. What if the runner has film critic? It turns off your punitives and it turns off the bacterial programming, preventing you from firing off all these wonderful effects. Well, it's time for Sadaka to come to the rescue. Sadaka or Sadaka or Sadaka, I don't know, um, is a trap ice in Jinteki. Now it's time to put your quiz hats on. I've been rambling on a lot about the other cards, but it's now your time. Now it's time for you to get into the action. Can you name all the ice that have been printed so far that have trash a resource printed on it? You have 30 seconds starting from now. Right, have you thought of all the ice? It turns out there are not that many. After uh, combing through the entire Netrunner DB, it turns out there are only two of them, both of which from the Wayland faction, a Tithonium and a Triple Advanced Colossus. Both of these have the Trash 1 resource clause, uh, along with Sadaka, of course. Now, of course, uh, Tithonium and Colossus are very conditional cards. Colossus requiring 3 advancement counters is kind of a deal breaker in my books. And Tithonium, well, it's really expensive and not that taxing in a paperclip meta. So this is where Sadaka can carve out a very powerful niche. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, <clears throat> resource trashing on as ice subroutines is design space that has been breached only very recently, I think this year. Um, previously, uh, in previous cycles and data packs. This is something that ice subroutines typically don't feature. Ice can trash programs, ice can trash hardware, but not resources. Um, and things have changed nowadays apparently. With more and more hate cards in the form of resources, it's good that there's now ice that can deal with that. And that's exactly what Sadaka was made for. I believe that Sadaka's best use is to uh, is uh, as hate against resource hate cards. Uh, against runners that don't pack AI breakers because if you don't have an AI breaker and no way to get past no other way to get past a darker like security nexus for example this ice can really ruin your day because if you were relying on a certain hate card like film critic uh, to deal with Jinteki shenanigans well your film critic's gone because of the second subroutine that allows you to trash a resource so this is very crucial for our deck because we are running punitives, bacterial programmings, and obviously as our restricted card, Obocarta protocol, all of which are completely shut down by Film Critic. So we need to shut down that Film Critic and Sadaka's, uh, the card that comes to rescue us. Uh, Sadaka also allows us um, to, if install an R&D, to manipulate R&D. Its first subroutine is incredibly flexible, almost on the level of bacterial programming. While it doesn't have the 7 card reach that bacterial programming boasts, it's, uh, it can do a lot because not only do you get to arrange them in any order as you would um, like an indexing, but you also get to optionally draw the top card after the arrangement. So this allows you to, for example, if you see uh, that one of the three top cards are agendas, you can pull the agenda into your hand. That saves you a click, uh, you know, click to draw. It enables you if you're a rush deck, and most importantly, it takes the agenda away from the runner who were running on R&D and was expecting to steal the agenda. No longer will they. This indirectly also hoses uh, runners like Adam's Find the Truth, like Guy's Spy Camera. Well, Sadaka pulls that agenda away. Not only that, um, it also gives you the option to just shuffle R&D entirely. This is a very good way to deal with a uh, if you see, for example, three the top three cards of R&D all being agendas and you don't want the runner to steal them all, well, just reshuffle R&D, double dip into it. Uh, so yeah, Sadaka so, so com combos extremely well with Mwanza because it sets up your Mwanza city grid. It allows you to manipulate the top cards of R&D to your advantage. 
you know, uh, one very powerful thing you can do is to put bacterial programming as the top card in R&D and let the runner access it because then they'll get three more accesses of R&D uh, which can potentially be snares and which could potentially fetch you the punitives that you were looking for. Very powerful synergy uh, and fits perfectly in this deck for multiple reasons. Now, just a bit of a rules clarification here. Sadaka's Self Trash, uh, it's a trap card that trashes itself, uh, like a lot of other trap ice. Its Self Trash is not contingent on the resource trash. What this means is, even if the second subroutine fails to trash a resource for any reason, let's say the runner has no resources installed and you chose to rest Sadaka and fire it for some reason, the Sadaka will still trash itself even if the trash one resource did not happen because they're both separate sentences, not contingent on one another. That's quite important to note. Alrighty, so with all that said and done, we are going to be exploring three different cards from Kitara Cycle, three Jinteki cards from three different data packs. How amazing is it that all these cards tie in so very nicely? It's as though the designer designed this entire cycle at one go. <laughs> well, um, it's... Pretty natural, I think. These cards really fit, fit in very well with each other. And let's see if we can make this work. Now, I took some inspiration, uh, besides from uh, the, the Kitara Cycle Jintaki cards, I took some inspiration from CTZ as well. Now, for those of you who are unaware, CTZ is one of the most famous uh, brand names when it comes to uh, innovative decks. CTZ makes absolutely wonderful decks that I always love uh, reading up on because his decks, uh, Andrew Cortez, I believe his name, uh, Andrew's decks are full of gusto and most importantly, full of heart. I absolutely love uh, the way he builds his decks. They are so, you know, come at me. Uh, and I abs that's exactly the aspect of Netrunner that I appreciate a lot. So... Very lovely deck building by him. Uh, regarding the idea of a punitive Palana deck, I've taken his need in terms of running Palana as the ID, as well as some of the uh, card choices. Data Loop as a good influence expenditure, a bulky barrier that most importantly makes the remote pretty hard to contest uh, because it forces the runner to lose two cards from the hand. Aiki as a very cheap central ice uh, that can protect your centrals early on. And Genetics Pavilion, a very inspired choice that limits the amount of card draw the runners can, uh, you know, draw. Which is very crucial when you are a damage deck trying to kill them. It's also a tempo card that forces the runner to spread their draw out across multiple turns, which fuels Palana's ability very well. All these deck choices, very inspiring. I'll be using these cards along with those cards that I mentioned earlier. Whew, look at the time! We spent so much time talking about those three cards and this CTZ deck. I'm afraid we don't have enough time to go into the playthrough, so you'll have to wait till next week where we actually showcase the gameplay. Okay, 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 I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Please don't go away, please don't unsubscribe. We'll get into the playthrough now. Stay tuned. If you remember our successful demo on viral weaponization, I mentioned that Jinteki has an inherent edge over the other corpse in that when you install Rashida behind a piece of Unrest Ice turn 1, the runner doesn't usually check because they are afraid of Cortex Lock, which is a very devastating uh, turn 1 ice to protect Rashida. I'm gonna leverage on that um, to get my Rashida off even though I don't have said small ice. Uh, I only have DNA Tracker, I only have Data Loop, both of which you know, are too expensive to rest at this stage in the game. That's fine. Uh, we are going to cheat the Rashida out here, uh, hedging on uh, the fact that our opponent won't run the remote. We also notice that a DDoS has been milled into the bin, courtesy of Max's ability. That is actually an important point to take note. It gives us a clue as to what kind of Max our opponent is. Oh, 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 they're running R&D! Unsuspecting runner detected. This is gonna be glorious. <laughs> They're gonna see four cards, any of them could be snares, any of them could be bacterial programmings. And the best part is, my component completely whiffed. No agendas in the top four, and we are going to draw all four of these cards on our next turn with Rashida and the mandatory draw. 
So we are gonna see what our opponent just saw off the top of R&D. We get 10 credits off Mwanza, putting us squarely um, in the uh, credit lead, allowing us to rest our uh, data loop, our DNA tracker. So many things going for us. And wait, is our opponent? No, no, they, they trash the Mwanza. It's freaking five to trash. Wow. <laughs> Uh, we take those! Oh my gosh, that's basically a reverse siphon. Ah, punitive! Double punitive! Oh, they saw double punitive off the top! Oh my gosh, this is awesome! My opponent just gave us all the money we need to play double punitive and they know it's coming. They are gonna be in such a world of hurt, but first let's show up that R&D, shall we? DNA tracker straight on top. Ooh, that's, that's, that's too much action in one turn. We gained 10 credits, our opponent lost 5 credits, we didn't lose a single agenda, instead we drew 2 punitives, and our opponent knows about it. How about that? We find bacterial programming, we are going to score it. Um, not enough time to install double advance though, uh, we have to respect the likes of DDoS. We'll just spend this turn putting a Komainu over the server and then attempt to score it next turn. Even though our opponent basically handed to us our alternate win condition on a silver platter, uh, drawing us into the punitives and giving us money to fire it off, uh, we still want to put the agenda pressure on our opponent, induce them into running the remote and making mistakes. So we still want to be scoring agendas. We can't just sit back and money up, waiting for them to steal an agenda. But hey, our opponent responds nicely to our turn 1 gambit as well by liberating an entire liberated account's worth of money. They are now kind of out of punitive range, which kind of concerns me a bit as the punitives are meant to protect this agenda I have sitting in server 1. Now of course, uh, they've dropped the bomb, <laughs> literally. Uh, EMP device. <laughs> um, that is an interesting card they're playing, and well, it seems like they're not going for a remote, they're gonna run R&D first. So, well, they don't have their black orchestra in the bin. Time to deal some net damage, time to take away some of their hard-earned money. We are going to snipe them for the same old thing, and a- Whoa! We hit the apocalypse! Okay! Okay! Uh, they steal a Kronos project, that's not good to see, those are the last two one-pointers that I have in my deck to round out my agenda suite, which is three Obokata, three Bacterial, that's 18 agenda points, I needed two more points, so two one-pointers there. Um, and the Dirty Laundry HQ, do they have a second Apocalypse in their hand? Uh-oh. Uh, Apocalypse is very, 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 very bad news for me here. Um, losing the agenda is kind of painful, but losing the Komainu into Data Loop on the remote is basically Backbreaking. I won't be able to score any future agendas anytime soon with that. And yeah, back um they can take their own sweet time to steal the bacterial in archives. Thankfully, it seems like I've diffused the threat. The DNA tracker successfully sniped the apocalypse that my opponent was intending to play. Ooh, I dodged a huge bullet right there. Granted, it was uh, slightly lower than a one in two chance, but man, I'm so happy that I actually uh you know, evaded that one there. So, uh, gonna score this bacterial, and we are going to have the most uh, analysis paralysis moment in the game ever, as I decide what to do with my seven cards. And here you see uh, one glaring weakness of bacterial programming in that its effect is a lot weaker when it's scored rather than stolen. Typically, when after you score it, you'll be proceeding straight to your discard phase as it's your last click, so you can only pull so many cards into your hand. Even though I want a lot of these cards, you know, the Sadaka, the Rashida, um, and the Genetics Pavilion, all of which are wonderful cards to have right now, pulling them into my hand means that I have to discard the other powerful cards in my hand, the Agenda, the Bluff in NGO Friend and of course the double punitive, which I'm not willing to do. So realistically, all I'm doing is setting up my deck. I need to think ahead about what I'm planning to do on my next turn. So one possible option was to top deck the Rashida and then jam it in my remote next turn to draw into the rest of my cards. But, you know, hand size is still a problem. Instead, I would like to rush out my Oboe Carter that is sitting in my hand. So next turn is probably going to be an install double advance from me. 
So what I'm going to do is to put Genetics Pavilion on top so that I draw it next turn. Uh, Genetics Pavilion, a very powerful uh, tempo reducing card against my opponent who is forced to draw one card uh, with Max's ability every turn. So Genetics Pavilion, you know, already taking out half their quota of card draw. Then we put Snare as the second card, very crucially. Uh, in case my opponent goes for a second apocalypse attempt, I want the snare to be on top of R&D on the turn where I attempt to score the Oboe Carter. That way I have a chance of sniping the second apocalypse from my opponent's hand if they so choose to run R&D and break the DNA tracker. So as promised, it's back to my turn. I'm going to install the double advance and double advance the Oboe Carter. Now in an ideal world, I would have Genetics Pavilion out in a separate remote while this is happening. Uh, that would really make it very difficult for my opponent to steal the Oboe Carter and then end with enough cards in the hand to survive double punitive. That's not happening. Um, and I can't really afford to wait one more turn because as mentioned, I do want to score the Oboe Carter on the turn where Snare is the top card of R&D to protect against Apocalypse. Now my opponent surprises me with a run amok mean and drops the bomb on top of that EMP device has been activated so I can only res one of these two ice. Uh, I chose to res the Kumainu and lose it here uh, simply because it doesn't have the long-term benefit that Data Loop has. Data Loop staying on the table is essential for me uh, because even if my opponent's completely set up in terms of breakers, uh, they still will have to lose two cards to Data Loop every time they run the remote. So I cannot afford to let it get trashed by Runamok. Instead, I'll let Komainu do the heavy lifting here. Uh, being a multi-sub sentry, it's going to cost my opponent 8 credits to install the MK Ultra and break 4 of the subroutines. One subroutine fires and it hits, coincidentally, the I've had worse, drawing them up into a very comfortable hand size, allowing them to steal the Oboe Carter. And then my opponent ends their turn by frantically drawing up and hoping to find an I've had worse that defends them from the double punitive. After all, they are way too poor at only 2 credits, landing the double punitive here is easy as pie for me. Now unfortunately for my opponent, um, both of us weren't really paying attention, but as it turns out, all 3 of their I've had worses are gone. They've all been either hit by net damage or milled by max, so... Double punitive here is going to seal up the game for me. Holy f***ing shit! I can't believe that deck actually worked. Uh, turns out Monza's shitty grid wasn't as shitty as I thought after all. The bonus 10 credits was absolutely crucial in landing double punitive. Without it, my opponent could have easily clicked up for credits on the last few clicks and I would not have been able to do the double punitive if I had 10 fewer credits. That being said, I'm going to stop short of saying that this is a competitive, let alone tier 1 deck. At the end of the day, I got incredibly lucky against my opponent, whose Apocalypse got sniped uh, from their hand on the turn they were going for it. And among other things, uh, drawing double punitive that early on basically cemented my alternate win con. Uh, you can't expect to reliably draw it every game, even in those games where bacterial programming comes into play. Right, now we've gone way over time. I think it's time to wrap it up with some combos and non-bows. Starting with bacterial programming. I did not mention this in the intro, but well, uh, the bacterial programming does have the effect where you can put cards in archives instead of R&D or HQ. Now, this is usually an option you wouldn't exercise simply because, well, why would you trash your own cards? But if there's one reason to do it, it's because of Breach Dome, which works best when stashed away in archives, deterring further archives runs. In fact, this is one of the best ways to tutor up your Breach Domes from your deck. Um, well, there's actually a subtlety about this because the cards are from R&D, they will actually be added to archives face down, giving us yet another possible interaction with industrial genomics. Uh, you can load up uh, your ID ability with bacterial programming um, by putting a bunch of cards in archives, ideally breach domes of course. Since they will be face down, they will add to the trash cost of all the cards they have in the game, which is pretty nice. A normal with bacterial programming unfortunately is Ginger City Grid. Uh, I actually theory crafted this when Bacterial Programming was first released and unfortunately upon closer inspection of the card text, I realized that Bacterial Programming adds cards to HQ instead of drawing them. There's a big difference there because this means that cards added to HQ 
cannot be uh, triggered, uh, cannot trigger Ginger City Grid. So you cannot instantly install cards that you draw off bacterial programming. Uh, that's not to say you can't play bacterial programming as an agenda in Ginger City Grid Jin, uh, Jinteki decks. However, uh, there are definitely better agendas to play in Ginger decks. Um, Ginger City Grid, you tend to build long, uh, you know, deep servers with lots of ice that are unrest, so you probably want some money, in which case SSL endorsement or sales team are better. And if you are dragging the runner you are, uh, through your remote, you want to do it multiple times, Nisei Mark II just does the job better. I don't think bacterial programming makes the cut in such decks. Moving on to Sadaka, which is a card we unfortunately did not get to show off this game. Our opponent died too quickly for that to happen. Um, it actually has a much better synergy with Data Loop than at first glance. I didn't actually notice this until uh, I was making up these slides here. So Data Loop, as we know, is all about the on-encounter effect. Um, you play it only because you want to force the runner to lose cards from the hand. Uh, while trying to run for an Oboe Carter. Now the problem with Data Loop is that there are a bunch of resources out there that deal very well with Data Loop. As mentioned, Film Critic is something we need to deal with in general, but also Hunting Grounds bypasses the on-encounter effect entirely. And Maxwell James uh, derezzes Data Loop, which is an expensive 7 to res. Um, oftentimes you cannot afford to res Data Loop multiple times, as it's too expensive. All these resources um, uh, are pretty terrible uh, to face up against if you're running a data loop deck and Sadaka happily shores that weakness up for you. Just plop your Sadaka in front of data loop and it will make the runner very sad because all these hate resources suddenly are gone as they are trashed from Sadaka, provided of course they don't have a way to break Sadaka themselves. Sadaka is also good not just as a remote ice but also as central ice protecting against indexing and as well as uh, Spy Camera and Finding the Truth, as we mentioned earlier on. So Sadaka, just a very versatile card that can help you out, especially in data loop decks. Finally, we move on to our core card in Wanza City Grid. Uh, I've mentioned so many interactions, but there's one I left out. If you want to experiment with this card, one thing you could possibly do is to play an offer you can't refuse, directing the runner into your Mwanza City Grid HQ. Now, this... Uh, just like punitive is actually another way um, to capitalize on um, uh, both effects that Mwanza provides. So the extra money is incredibly useful because an offer you can't refuse is a very expensive 4 to play. So uh, that really helps out there. The other aspect of multi-access um, really shores up an offer you can't refuse which is uh, a very weak card because um, it it is restricted to centrals only. So usually the most impactful cards that uh, go well with an offer you can't refuse are ambushes, cards like Snare and um, yeah, Snare is the main one I'm thinking of. You can't really force the runner into running into a Snare with an offer you can't refuse because it is originally a central only card. It's very difficult to manipulate your uh, board state such that the runner has a guaranteed chance of hitting a snare. You know, you could do Kitsune, I guess, but um, you know, it's a lot of moving pieces. Mwanza City Grid basically takes care of that for you. Not only does it basically guarantee the runner uh, hitting a snare in your hand, uh, if you have multiple ambushes in your hand, they are in a lot of trouble. So, Mwanza City Grid actually synergizes very well with an offer you can't refuse for that very reason. It tells the runner, hey look, you're gonna access my entire hand. Are you willing to gamble that there are not multiple ambushes in my hand that will outright kill you? And often that means that you can get an offer you can't refuse uh, firing for its agenda point, which if you build your deck correctly is something you can leverage very well on. Ultimately, however, I think the way I use Monster City Grid in this um, punitive Palana is probably the single best use case for Mwanza. If you are looking to build a Mwanza deck, this is probably the strongest you can get right now. Um, again, I'm not gonna say it's top tier, but I think it's fairly good for a Mwanza deck, and hopefully you agree. 
uh, as irrepresentative as this single playthrough might be. Well, I'm quitting while I'm ahead uh, with this 100% win rate punitive Pala uh, Palana Wanza deck. Well, you can try it out for yourself and let me know how it goes. In the meantime, as always, thanks for watching and happy net running. I'm sure a lot of you will pilfer my deck list in the description. Seems like a pretty fun deck after all. Can't blame you for that. Well, have fun!